story I'm referring to is the uh, I don't even know how old she was Miss P how old were you when you first started playing piano like five seven, seven? I don't know why that story just tickles me but I love to tell it the first time Tabitha went up to play the piano for, I guess it was a special music. You know, everybody was just on pins and needles in the church that morning, and she was seven years old, and she went up, I mean, just like a little professional, and she sat down, and, and in two, maybe three seconds, the song was done. And, you know, she stood up and just looked so proud of herself. And, of course, her mother and her dad were so proud of her. And she walked back like a little professional pianist and sat down. And it, it just... <laughs> it's absolutely true, Evan. Almost 10 years ago, Tabitha did that. And everybody was so proud of her. She, she had played all of 2.5 to 3 seconds, and it was just a thrill. And now 10 years later, to have her walk up like it's nobody's business, and she can play any song, it's just, it's beautiful to see where she started and now where she is. And uh, what a blessing. And now she's got her driver's license. And uh, she's just, that, that's just thrilling. That's just thrilling. So good job, Miss P. Good job. Well, let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much that when our commitment to you is like two and a half to three seconds, Thank you that your song says, just as I am. Uh, it doesn't say to come back when you're perfect. And it doesn't say to come back when you know every song in the hymnal. But it says, come and submit to me today. Thank you that we can do that. And thank you that we can study your word today. And that one day soon, by your grace, by your power, in our lives, uh, we're, you're going to see your reflection. You're going to see your character. Father, we can't believe that, but you promised it to us, and so it's going to happen. Help us just to get out of the way so that you can do it for each one of us. And please send the Holy Spirit to encourage us, to strengthen us, to convict us as to what you want for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to look at something this morning, as the slide says, about the Valley of Dry Bones. We're in Ezekiel chapter 37, if you'd like to open your Bibles there. This is part 20 in our series. Uh, God willing, next Sabbath we're going to look at the other half of Ezekiel 37 on the tail of two sticks. And then uh, we'll look at Gog and Magog right down the road. But today we're going to look at a valley of dry bones. Doesn't sound too exciting, does it? Doesn't sound very encouraging, does it? So why did Ezekiel write about a bunch of dry bones? Let's take a look and see if we can figure it out this morning. Go ahead, sweetie. What's it say? There we got it. There's the valley of dry bones. A bunch of femurs and tibulas and craniums or skulls and a couple of ribs I see there and let's see those are hand bones let's see is that metacarpals is that what it is metacarpals okay so 
I mean, uh, that's pretty exciting stuff, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, isn't that good, Aiden? Yeah, I know. Boy, I'd hate to be considered about... I'm sure that that's not referring to any of us because we're not a bunch of... Well, let's see what it's talking about. Go ahead, sweetie. There we are. Lifeless. Can't do anything. Not aware of anything. Totally pitiful. And our obvious response, of course, would be, I'm sure glad I'm not like them. Well, we'd better think again. We'd better think again. Next slide, sweetie. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, the hand of the Lord. I'm going to stop there for a minute just to clarify something because last week in the Bahamas on Friday evening, a lady got up and uh, she had the opening prayer. And I didn't hear any kind of silliness all week that I was in the Bahamas, but Friday evening at the opening prayer, the lady said, and Yahweh, we pray for thus and so. And I said, whoops. And then Saturday night after the talk I gave on the Red Sea crossing, this dear lady walked up to me with a, uh, a packet of materials about this thick. And it was all about how we can only call God by one name. And so I thought, well, I think it's time to hit it. So Sunday morning at the beginning of the meeting, I was talking about uh, victory over sin. And uh, this uh, we talked about in Genesis chapter 3. And so I mentioned to the people, I said, you know, God has many names. And to fixate on one name is not biblical. Because the first name God referred to himself by was Elohim in Genesis chapter 1. And Elohim is plural. So the name Elohim in Genesis chapter 1, it should actually read, and God's said, let there be light. And God's said, let us make man in our own image. So there are many names for God in the Old Testament. And to fixate on one is not biblical. And then I talked about Yahweh and I said, Yahweh is a beautiful name for God. It means it's the one who is. It's the one who rightly judges everything that happens. And I said, Yahweh is a great name for God, but it's not the only name. And I noticed the dear lady that had given me the packet when I started talking about God's names. I just happened to, you know, take a little peek out of the corner of my left eye. And I just happened to notice that she was intently listening. Hopefully she got the message. I'm going to write to her this coming week to tell her thank you for her packet. But God has many names, and we don't need to fixate on one because it's not biblical. But in the Old Testament, as we see in Ezekiel 37, whenever you find the name Lord in your King James Bible, capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D, that's the translation of the name Yahweh. It is. That's what it is. So... Ezekiel says, the hand of Yahweh was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of, and there's Yahweh again, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very, very, they were very dry. Then he said to me, okay, now this is a later verse, in Ezekiel chapter 37. He said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. So these, this valley of dry bones, obviously it's symbolic. And it represents the whole house of Israel. Now, as we study 
this chapter today, it will become very clear that these bones and this house of Israel to whom that is applying, it represents the people of God at the end of time. That's who this valley of dry bones is. And if we're going to be honest, and I'm going to try to be honest this morning, folk, our only hope is in realizing that apart from Christ, that's what we are. We are utterly dead in trespasses and sins apart from Jesus Christ. We can't do good. We can't. It's an impossibility. We need to recognize what we are and who we are or there is no hope for us. There's no hope. Next slide. Now those valley of dry bones, as I was thinking about it, it's just like the virgins in Matthew 25. Notice this. Now, in the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25, 1 to 5, there were ten. How many of them were wise? Five were wise, and then how many were foolish? Five. Five wise, five foolish. The five wise took something with their lamp. What did they take with their lamp? They took oil. And we're going to find today that it was the oil that made all the difference for the valley of dry bones. Now, the five that were foolish didn't take oil. Now, but do you remember something that they all had in common? They were all asleep. See, while the bridegroom tarried, and who's the bridegroom? Jesus is. Jesus is the bridegroom. And it says he tarried. That means he didn't show up when people were expecting him to. So when he didn't show up when they were expecting, what did all the virgins do? They were snoozing. They were snoring. That's exactly right, Evan. You snooze, you lose. It's exactly right. Well, folk, that means, what does that mean? What, what is that verse saying we are doing today? We're all asleep. You say, but well, wait a minute. I, I, I think I know what's going on in the world. And, and by the grace of God, I'm trying to warn people. And by the grace of God, I'm seeking to follow all of his commands. The Bible says I'm asleep. That we're all asleep. And we all need to be awakened to realize the controversy that we're in. We all need that, folks. So we're all snoring. We're all a valley of dry bones. And that's okay. That's okay. If we recognize it and do something about it. Next slide. What a fitting symbol for us today. You know, amongst us as a people, we have conference people versus independent. You know, this radio program I'm on on Wednesday mornings, I was given an ultimatum. There's certain things you don't say, and if you say them, you're out. Okay? And the whole issue, folks, it's not a matter of, am I preaching the truth on this station? That's not the issue at all. It's, it's over this. The conference versus independence or self-supporting ministries. It's not, you know, we get so wrap, wrapped up in all the minors. And those are minors. The issue is not self-supporting versus conference. The issue is truth. That's the issue. And if you're following the truth and you're teaching the truth by the grace of God, folk, one day, as we're going to find next week, Conference people and independents will one day unite. Those that are faithful will one day unite together. It, so the issue is not conference versus self. No, the issue is over truth. And will I submit to the truth? That's the issue. That's the issue. But you've got this bickering going on. You've got one heresy after another, picking off people by the scores. Just... You know, it's like that little thing Evan made this morning. He had these five pieces of paper wrapped up, 
and he had a rubber band at the end of it and he stuck a pin inside. He pulled it back and he went zing and it went straight into a box in the... Oh, maybe I wasn't supposed to tell him what we were doing during Sabbath school, was I? Um, ooh. Folk. <laughs> Amongst us as a people today, people are getting picked off. Just getting picked off one after another after another over all kinds of crazy ideas. If it's not the 2520, I had a lady this week sent me an email. She said, you've got to study this. This is the truth. And I said, no, it's not. And I'm not going to waste my time with it. Folk, we get so caught up in all these crazy things. The feast days. What name to call God? Is the Holy Spirit a person? Is Ted Wilson following God? Can he be trusted? How about the King of the North? Uriah Smith should be listened to like the Spirit of Prophecy. Will we be saved in sin? Can I just love Jesus? And the beat goes on. We are a valley of dry bones as were ancient Adventists. Our focus is all wrong. We get sidetracked so quickly from what God wants us to do. So quickly. We're a valley of dry bones. We're lifeless. Just like the ancient Seventh-day Adventists that came to Jesus at night and he said, Master, we know. We know you're a teacher come from God. He went to get into a theological discussion with the Son of God. And Jesus said, I don't want to discuss religion with you. I want you to give me your life. I want you to make me the Lord of your life so that your life can be changed. That's all that mattered. It wasn't about theological discussion. But this is all we get involved in, is all this kind of foolishness. Next slide. We're a valley of dry bones, folk. Ezekiel 37, 3 and 4. This is our only hope. It says, He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again he said to me, prophesy upon these bones and say to them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is the answer for the valley of dry bones. Will you listen to what God says? Not what you think it says. You know, that's the thing that is so fascinating to me is, is that I had a guy call me this week and he said, you know, I just know I need to keep the feast days. And I said, well, you know, I can't go along with you. But if, if that's what you feel you have to do, well, you know, I can tell you all the reasons why you shouldn't. But if that's what you want to do, go ahead. I said, the most important thing is, is that you and I are submitting our lives to Christ in order to follow His commandments. That's the most important thing. He said, well, you know, I, I just think Ellen White, you know, I think she encourages the keeping of the feast days. And I said, well, you know, I said, friend, Ellen White did not have a wax nose. I said, she did not have trouble with human communication. It's very plain what Ellen White was saying. And she was not endorsing the keeping of the feast days. I said, we've got to listen to what God says. Because it's only in the Word that the Holy Spirit, as we study the Word of God and are willing to submit ourselves to what God says, that we're going to have life. The Bible says in John 6, 63, it's the Spirit that quickens the flesh, profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, a man in the Bahamas came up to me after one of the meetings and he said, he said, I want what you have been preaching. 
I want to know Christ. He said, how do I do it? I said, well, it's, it's very simple. I said, if you want to be like somebody, then you've got to spend time with them. If you want to have power in your life, then you've got to connect yourself to the source of power. I said, what time do you get up? What time do you have to go to, the work in, in, go to work in the morning? He said, about 8 o'clock. I said, okay, how long does it take you to eat? Visit with your family? Get your children ready for school? Whatever you do, how long does it take? He said, about an hour. I said, okay, so you have to be at work at 8. So you go back an hour, that's time for the family and to get to work, okay? So that puts you at seven. I said, do you have anything else you need to do? He said, no. I said, okay, then you need to wake up at six o'clock in the morning to spend at least an hour of time in prayer and in study of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. I said, at least an hour. And I said, you need to get up at six o'clock in the morning to do that. He said, oh, but, but boy, if, if I did that, that means I'd have to get to bed at a certain time, around 10 o'clock at night. I said, that's exactly what I'm saying. He said, oh, but I can't do that. I said, well, what time do you get to bed? He said, oh, around 11 or 12 o'clock. I said, well, you need to adjust your schedule then. I said, if you want to have power in your life, then you need to make time with the source of power. You need to get to know the man of power. He said, but, but every night at 9 o'clock, 9.30, I think of a hundred things I need to do. And I said, well, tell me something. Who do you think it is that tells you of a hundred things you need to do at 9 or 9.30 at night so that you get to bed at 10.30, 11.30, or even midnight. I said, who do you think it is that's telling you all those things you need to do? He said, I never thought of that. I said, well, let me tell you who it is. It's the devil. And the devil wants to destroy you, and he wants to keep you from that time with Christ in the morning. He said, that's kind of clear. I said, I try to make things pretty clear. He said, I'm going to do it. Folk, those are not options. That's not an option. That's not a hit and miss. That's not a, well, I didn't do it today, but I'll do it to No! That's a must. That's a must, folks. That's like somebody going into surgery and they, they don't have, they've lost a lot of blood and so before they go into surgery, what do they do? They give somebody a blood transfusion. The blood transfusion is not an option. The doctor doesn't come in and say, well, you know, we'll just give it to them later. No. No. It's not an option, folks. If we don't spend that time with Christ that day, we might as well forget that day. Because we're going to be overcome with something. The Apostle John, in, in 1 John chapter 2, he said, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. One of those things will knock us down. Because the devil's had 6,000 years of practice and he knows just what to do to destroy us. We better connect ourselves to the source of power. Jesus said, our flesh profits this much. Nothing. Yet. The empty set. Or zilcho. That's how much our flesh profits. Nothing. The words of Christ are spirit and their life. Their life. Next slide. Desire of Ages says the life of Christ that gives life to the world is in his word. It was by his word that Jesus healed disease and cast out demons. 
By His word, He stilled the sea and raised the dead. And the people bore witness that His word was with power. He spoke the word of God as He had spoken through all the prophets and teachers of the Old Testament. The whole Bible is a manifestation of Christ. The Savior desired to fix the faith of His followers on the word. When His visible presence should be withdrawn, the word must be their source of power. Like their master, they were to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Next slide. And now Ezekiel introduces us. He says, hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel 37, 5 and 6. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Notice references here, folk. It says, I will cause breath to enter into you. I will put breath in you. So there's a couple of references here to breath. What is that? What's the breath of God that he infuses into human beings, not mystically, not in a weird way, not in a magical way, but how does God's breath become a part of a human life? How does that happen? Through his words, Dennis, that's exactly right. Just as Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. They're God's breath to us. If we spend time with that word, then the life of God becomes a part of our life. It's not something mystical. It's not something magical. It's very simple. Very simple. Next slide. Yes, sir. That's a fascinating parallel, Errol, both creation and also in a medical perspective for a human being to not have air for three minutes. It's over. It's over. Now, you, you wonder, Errol, in light of that illustration, the Bible says, My people have forgotten me days without number. Jeremiah 2 says that. So we, we forget God days without number. So we cut ourselves off from the oxygen supply. What is the result, Errol? It's death. It's death. The churches... Churches today are completely dead. And so what do they do to supply the death-like power that rests over those churches? Well, you bring in music with a rock beat. And, and you, you get ministers up there to speak for 15 minutes telling silly stories that make people laugh. And then people, you know, they, they throw themselves on the ground and they start going like that. And they think they've got the Holy Spirit. That's insanity. They entertain you. It's exactly right, Nellie. It's entertainment. Folk, this is our only hope. This is our only hope. Ezekiel 37, 7 to 9. It says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as, as I prophesied, there was a noise, a shaking. The bones came together, bone to his bone. When I beheld, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above. But there was no breath in them. Then said he to me, Prophesy to the wind. So here's another symbol. We have the breath in the previous verses. Now we have to the wind. Say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. 
So again, folk, we have these symbols. We have breath. We have wind. We have air. Come from the four winds and breathe on these people that they may live. And therein is our hope. Therein is our hope. For the Holy Spirit to come upon us as it came upon people of old. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, what will it do? Will we start speaking in garble and gibberish? Is that the manifestation? No! When the Holy Spirit takes control of a person's life, there will be obedience to the commandments of God. And that, friend, is the greatest miracle. That is the greatest miracle that this world longs to see today is a human life submitted to the power of God to walk in obedience to all of God's commandments. That is a miracle of the Holy Spirit. Next slide. That's what God wants to give to us. Notice Desire of Ages, page 172. The various symbols we were reading in Ezekiel 37. The wind. The wind is heard among the branches of the trees, rustling the leaves and flowers. But it's invisible. No man knows whence it comes or whither it goes. So with the work of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's stop right there for a minute. So the Holy Spirit works upon our heart. Now, folk, when we see the word heart there, what does it mean? The mind. That's right, Dennis. The Holy Spirit works on our mind. And the devil assaults us in the mind too, doesn't he? So you have a war going on in your mind. And the Holy Spirit moves upon our mind and says, I want you to give that up. I want you to give that up because it's destroying you. I will give you the strength. I've given you the power of choice. And I'm going to give you the strength. Now, you make it the right choice. I'll give you the power, and you will obey. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Where do we see the Holy Spirit? No. It's like the wind. You go outside, you see the wind blowing in the trees, you know the wind is there because your thoughts, processes are starting to change. What you once loved, now you say, I can't stand that. It's killing me. Get it out of here. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. He works on the mind. Invisibly, can't see Him. But you know by what's going on in your head and how you're responding to the Spirit of God. It can no more be explained than can the movements of the wind. A person may not be able to tell the exact time or place or to trace all the circumstances in the process of conversion. But this does not prove him to be unconverted. By an agency as unseen as the wind, Christ is constantly working upon the heart, the mind. Little by little, perhaps unconsciously to the receiver, impressions are made that tend to draw the soul to Christ. These may be received through meditating upon Him, through reading the Scriptures, or through hearing the Word from the living preacher. Suddenly, as the Spirit comes with more direct appeal, the soul gladly surrenders itself to Jesus. By many, this is called sudden conversion, but it is the result of long wooing by the Spirit of God, a patient, protracted process. So if we do something wrong, does the Holy Spirit just leave and say, you're done, that's it, I don't want anything else to do with you, I've stopped trying. Is that what happens? 
No. The Spirit comes back and says, that's not right. That's going to destroy you. Give it to Christ. Confess your sin. And through His power and through your choice, you can turn away from that. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Next slide. It's like Pentecost. Just like Ezekiel 37, it's just like Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost was full come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. There's that same wind we find in Ezekiel 37. And we know that that was the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon the disciples. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. Say, now wait a minute, Bill. You were just downing the gift of tongues. But that's, that says that the gift of tongues is what happens when the Holy Spirit comes. Folk, there's a big difference between the speaking in tongues in Acts chapter 2 and the gibberish of today. This right here in Acts chapter 2 was to meet a need of ignorant, uneducated disciples who did not know the languages of the Mediterranean world. And so the Holy Spirit gave them power so that all the men from all over the Mediterranean heard the gospel message in their own language. That's the gift of tongues. The gibberish of today is a counterfeit of the devil himself to get people to believe that they are blessed with God when in actuality they are heading to perdition. Next slide. Now the same Holy Spirit that came and fell on the disciples at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 we know from the spirit of prophecy that the Holy Spirit will come again, but next, the time, next time it comes, it will be with greater power than it was in Acts chapter 2. We read these two statements from Ellen White from the Spalding McGann collection, pages 3 and 4. She said, I saw the latter reign of the Holy Spirit is coming suddenly as the midnight cry with ten times the power. Ten times the power of the midnight cry. Now how powerful was the midnight cry? Well, great controversy, pages 399 and 400. It says this, they carried strong conviction of their truthfulness and the midnight cry was heralded by thousands of believers. Okay? So she's talking about the midnight cry. Now how powerful was it? Like a tidal wave, the movement swept over the land. So how powerful is going to be the latter rain? Ten times the power of a tidal wave. Ten times the power of a tidal wave. You know, I had a man from New York City yesterday call me on the phone and he said, he said, Bill, I, can't, I cannot believe uh, something. He said, here in the New York conference, he said, I go from church to church to church and he said, all I hear is foolishness and garbage. That's what he said. He said, that's what I hear. He said, I hear 15-minute silly stories and jokes, and then I'm told to put my money in the till and to go home till next Sabbath. He said, that is what I hear. And I said, I said, Gene, I said, God gives everybody choice. But I said, I want to tell you something. I said, the, the programs that we have going on in South Central Africa right now that are covering over 11, uh, 13, 11 to 13 countries, I said, Gene, don't worry 
about the foolishness going on in those churches in New York. Because I said, what's going on in South Central Africa? I said, one day very soon, it's not just going to cover South Central Africa. It will cover Europe, Asia, and all of North and South America. Because I said, the truth of God in this world is going to win. He said, I appreciate hearing that because he said it gets really discouraging in these churches. Folk, how can I say that it's going to win? Because Ellen White says that the midnight cry, the latter rain, will come with ten times the power of a tidal wave. That movement is going to be so powerful and so awesome, no one, no one, will stand in its way. Next slide. Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 10 says, So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, into the valley of dry bones. They were possessed by the Spirit of God, and they lived and stood upon their feet. And what were they? An exceeding great army. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 10 said, Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the sun, clear as, or fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? God's people folk are going to be small in number. It's always been that way. It will never change. Simply because people don't want to choose to follow Christ. But folk, that small group of people will be a mighty, unstoppable army. I want to share a statement with you about another place at another time. Next slide, sweetie. Of an unstoppable, unconquerable army. In the book Great Controversy, after the murder of John Huss and the murder of Jerome in the 15th century, right around 1415, in Bohemia, Constance was the name of the city. After their murder, the people of Bohemia were so upset that Huss and Jerome had been killed that they started to have their own church services, they started to do it in their own language. They started to resist the power of the papacy. And as a result, the papacy came against Bohemia with monstrous armies. Now listen to this story. Great Controversy, page 116. The Pope proclaimed a crusade against the Hussites of Bohemia. And again, an immense force was precipitated upon Bohemia but only to suffer terrible defeat. Another crusade was proclaimed in all the papal countries of Europe. Men, money, munitions of war were raised. Multitudes flocked to the papal standard, assured that at last an end would be made of the Hussite heretics. Confident of victory, the vast force entered Bohemia. The people rallied to repel them. The two armies approached each other until only a river lay between them. Can you just see it? You know, this small group of men, maybe a few thousand, and on the other side of this river, you're talking about a couple of million men? And they come, and there's a river separating the two. And they just look at each other. They just look at each other. And I'm sure that the, this mighty army, they're just, you know licking their chops because they know that, that that small army over there is going to be mincemeat in a matter of a few hours. Well, the crusaders were in greatly superior force, but instead of dashing across the stream and closing in battle with the Hussites, whom they had come so far to meet, they stood gazing in silence at those warriors. Then suddenly, a mysterious terror fell upon the host. Without striking a blow, that mighty force broke and scattered 
as if dispelled by an unseen power. Great numbers were slaughtered by the Hussite army, which pursued the fugitives, and an immense booty fell into the hands of the victors, so that the war, instead of impoverishing, enriched the Bohemians. Folk, go back and read that chapter. Read the chapter about the death of Huss and Jerome in Great Controversy. Read about the armies, the crusades that were raged against Bohemia, the land of John Huss, and how time after time after time an unseen power intervened on behalf of the Hussite forces and the papal armies were routed again and again and again. Next slide. Throughout scripture, there is a name that refers to God as the commander of the armies of the universe. The name is Yahweh Sabaoth. In the King James Bible, it's translated Lord of Hosts. In the Hebrew, what that Lord of Hosts means is Commander of the Armies of the Universe. Awesome name to describe the one who will fight the battles of his lowly children. Folk, it was Yahweh Sabaoth, the Commander of the Armies of the Universe, that went to battle for the Hussite armies. It is this same name that you and I can invoke when tempted to do wrong that we know will hurt us. We can call on the name Yahweh Sabaoth, the commander of the armies of the universe, and ask for God to give us deliverance and to give us victory. And he shall. Next slide. It was this name that Martin Luther invoked when he wrote the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It was that name that David, the shepherd boy, referred to his God as when he went before Goliath. David said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, the commander of the armies of the universe. And David with his little Sling in his stone, he told the monster and all the Philistine hosts, you come to me with your javelin and your shield and your sword, but I come to you in the name of the commander of the armies of the universe, and he will deliver you into my hands. Praise God, folks. It will be Yahweh Sabaoth who fought for David, who fought for Luther and the Protestants, who will fight, who will fight for us today and will help us to do what we cannot do. This was the same name that was invoked in Zechariah 4, verse 6, where it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Same name, friends. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Next slide. Ezekiel 37, 11 to 14. He said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Our bones are dried, our hope is lost, we're cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, O my people, I will open your graves, cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. God will take a valley of dry bones. 
He will take your life. He will take my life. Lifeless, powerless, incapable of any good. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, He will enable us to obey and to do what we cannot do by ourselves. Praise God, friends, for this awesome passage in Ezekiel 37. Next slide. In closing, the same voice, the same voice, the same word that brought into existence mountains, that brought into existence great forests of trees, they brought in the beautiful lakes, the pristine lakes and the gorgeous meadows that in this sin-scarred world still we behold with awe and with beauty. It's that same word that says to us today, I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. I'm so thankful today that as we leave this place, we don't have to leave here alone. We can know of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives to empower us to do what we can't do. Praise God. Praise God, friends. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you today for this awesome passage in Ezekiel 37. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to take a valley of dry bones, which are your people today. You're going to do something amazing. You're going to do something incredible. Father, thank you that that same power that will one day do awesome things in this earth Thank you that you promise that you will put that power, the Holy Spirit, in our minds today to strengthen us to fight against temptation, to resist the power of sin so that we can walk as your humble little, little children. Thank you for this a wonderful, abundant promise. Help us to cling to it throughout this beautiful Sabbath day you've given to us. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.